All right. Um, it seems like I finally got my streaming rig set back up again. It only took me multiple hours today to make this work, but um, it looks like I am online again. Wow. All right. So, right. Doom. Hey, Font Lord is there. Great. I see you too, Font Lord. Um, so this is Doom, which, uh, this is Doom Eternal, which it turns out that really long time ago, like 20 years ago, I actually worked on the first two Doom games, Doom 1 and Doom 2, um, and I don't really think I've played a Doom game since, <laughs> basically since 20 years ago. So, I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to play Doom Eternal. I don't know how much I'm going to play, but I'm going to test our streaming setup today. So here we go. Yeah, so welcome to Fudge Nugget and Rosevov and Sono Flow Kid, bleh, something. Um, yeah, I spent a huge number of hours playing Doom back in the day, obviously, because I was working on Doom and Doom 2 and Quake and Quake 2, and I built a huge number of the maps. Um, that you play in those games, and if you Against did play them, ah! That hell can conjure, it's already very dark. All the wickedness that mankind can produce, we will send unto them only you. And it's also a lot darker and, and more uh, done. and more high res than I remember the Doom we worked on being. You guys will have to let me know if the volume is a bit too loud or not. Yeah, I remember back when we were making Doom, cinematics like this would have made our heads explode for the uh, level of detail and quality that are in them. Billions of casualties. That sounds like... Uh, What's going on in the world right now? Is this actually coronavirus, the video game? Don't know. Yeah, so back when I was working on Doom, we were working with resolutions that were measured in like 640 by 480 or 320 by 200. And so if you go back and you look at those games now, they're basically like blurry pixel boxes. And it's amazing to me how much our imaginations filled in uh, what was going on in the story and in those games compared to this, which is like I can't remember what I said it at 1200 by something, 1800 by something pretty freaking high res, I think there's probably more polys in one scene here than where it would have been an entire Doom game period Which actually, this is becoming a uh oh, sorry, this is becoming a bit of an issue um, with game creation because the amount of detail that goes into building a game these days is incredible. When we made Doom, Doom Two, Quake, Quake Two, our entire team was about eight people, eight or nine people, um, and it would take eight or nine people something like um, it would take us like a year and a half to make a game. Uh, I'm gonna guess that Doom Eternal probably has a team numbering, you know, upwards of a hundred, or maybe a lot of these modern games have teams of 200 and 300 people. I know that my last big AAA game, which was Alice Madness Returns, we had an internal team of 80, and uh, we had an external team of another hundred something. So, um, uh oh, apparently I can't connect to online, offline, whatever. Yeah, so, um, that's not cool. I don't care about being online for your rewards. Um, so yeah, I mean, this this game, I'd be curious to know. I don't know if anybody in the chat knows how long this took to build or how many people it took to build it, but, um, like I was saying, Alice Madness Returns was an internal team of 80. We had an external team of, like, 200 artists. I mean, artists are a really big part of this. Um, all the art that gets made. One of these models can take an artist days or weeks, depending on how complex it is. All right, I'm gonna have to read this for a second. Apparently I can damage a demon and get a glory kill. Uh, right. 
I don't know how many of you have played this new Doom. Um, but this is my first time, and uh, I'm going to be learning all over again. Anyway, we'll see. See how this goes. Um, this is looking a lot more medieval than I was expecting. I think I was I was kind of thinking there was going to be a um, some kind of space station-y business going on, but this is very, like, hellish. And uh, not what I was expecting as a, as a young space marine who hasn't been in space doing marine stuff for a long time. I remember when we... When we were beta testing the first Doom, um, there was a door that you started off at at the very beginning of the game, and because first-person shooters at that point were kind of, like, they were quite new, um, a lot of testers didn't have a sense of, like, what a first-person shooter was, and so there was this silver door at the very start of, the, of Doom 1, um, Episode 1, Level 1, E1, M1, and people would go to the door and like hit the space bar and try to get the door to open for ages and you'd have to finally like break um, through to them and say hey that door doesn't open please stop but they wanted to know why they wanted to know why the one door in the level didn't work um, and you kind of had to explain to them well you had to come from somewhere and you can't go back you know <clears throat> oh my god what's going on here uh, are we in some sort of a tutorial area uh, uh, I'm being. I can't shoot. Um, so that. What does that mean? Shit. What have I done? Can I? Oh, it's forcing me to chainsaw these guys. That was a lot of. Uh, a lot of cutting going on. Oh, so this is just a side, like a melee, instant hit kind of weapon. Oh, very nice. That makes sense. So yeah, the only way is through. Who said that? That was a uh, rar Savor. Yeah, that's a Nine Inch Nails track. Um, which is the other thing I was reminded of when I first launched this. Is that an exploding barrel? Oh, I love exploding barrels. Yeah, I was, I was reminded of um, the music and the ambient sounds that we did on Quake with uh, Trent Reznor and his guys, the Nine Inch Nails. I used to go to New Orleans quite frequently to work with them on sound effects, so I don't even know who <laughs> who did the sound effects for this, but it sounds very Nine Inch Nails-y. Um, what's happening here? It clearly wants me to do something, but I don't know what. Am I supposed to shoot this until it... no. Now I'm going to be the dumb beta tester who doesn't know how to get through the door until... It'll be funny if like I, I start this up and five seconds in I get stuck <laughs> and I can't continue. I wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, it does feel like I should be doing something with this, but I don't know exactly what. I'm gonna have to look to the chat for help in a second here. I find it very difficult to play games and stream, especially when they're new games. I'm sort of distracted by the fact that I'm streaming and by the fact that I'm talking, and um, it makes me be a really sh terrible uh, game player when I'm doing that. All right, I'm gonna look to the chat. Uh, exploding barrels, melee. Yeah, how do I? Uh, how am I supposed to get through here? Somebody give me a hint here. So I wasn't really paying attention to the um, to the uh, tutorial, so I probably missed something important about about how to um, get through the door here. And I'm literally gonna get stuck. Not even five minutes into. <laughs> into playing this for the first time. Embarrassing. Terribly embarrassing. This is why you're supposed to be here, Martin. Oh, there we go. E did it. Okay. Double jump. I think I can handle a double jump. There we go, and a ledge climb. Nice. That's funny, I pressed E on that when I first saw it, but it didn't take. I'm gonna blame that on a hardware failure. So yeah, it was pretty crazy when we worked on the first game. I'm curious, um, who who did do the music for this? Does anybody know who it was? It wasn't Nine Inch Nails, was it? He's gonna have to look that up for me. Um, choose a weapon mod. Okay. I saw somebody said, get Sticky Bombs. I saw that on Twitter. So I'm gonna go straight for Sticky Bombs. Thanks, person on Twitter. Alright, to press 
Uh huh, a mouse, and then press a mouse one to fire. All right, I'll try to remember that. You know, I'm getting old. Is that a sticky bomb? Oh, that was pretty good. All right, I liked the sticky bomb. It was all right. Yeah, so where was I? Um, Nine Inch Nails. So Nine Inch Nails did the music on Quake, and then I think they did some music after that, after I, I was let go from id, unceremoniously fired. Um, I think they came back and did something for one of the, the later games. Um, that didn't work. But for me, that was a pretty uh, fun experience because I got to uh, spend a lot of time working with those guys. Now, of course, that wasn't on um, either of the Doom games. For the first Doom game, it was Bobby... Um, oh, shit, I'm gonna, I always forget Bobby's last name. Um, anyway, there was a Bobby um, who did the music for the first one for sure. And I can't remember who if he was on the second Doom as well. Um, Might have been. All right, that guy got some chainsaw action. Anyway, I am not a very good Doom historian, it turns out. Um, if you want Doom history, you'd have to talk to John Romero, because he's got like a brain full of, of Doom, and uh, he's, he's like the Doom historian. I know he's got all kinds of memorabilia and paraphernalia, um, design documents, all kinds of stuff. And um, I just wasn't really paying attention that much. I was too in awe of the fact that I'd got hired um, to work at a video game company when I had been a car mechanic. So that was like my story was I started off, I was a car mechanic, I was a high school dropout, and um, I was living next door to John Carmack, and he one day, kind of out of the blue, offered me a job to be a beta tester on Doom. I had been playing uh, Wolfenstein, which was its title before this, and um, so I got to go from being a car mechanic and uh, like literally blowing myself up and burning myself down in a car shop to burning myself up and blowing myself down or whatever uh, inside of Doom, which was a pretty crazy life transition. I uh, have much in life to, to, uh, to be thankful for that's related to John Carmack making that offer to me. Uh oh, I think I'm about to die here. Yeah, I'm not very good at this game. As you can tell, I haven't been FPSing for quite a while here, so... Getting low on health. Was that a health thing? Oh yeah, alright. Yeah, so when I got hired at id, I, um, I went straight to answering the phones, actually. I was testing the games and I was answering the phones with a guy named Sean Green, and uh, we used to sit there and play the game while doing tech support phone calls, and people would call us with like the craziest tech support issues. Um, we'd have people threatening to sue us because our games had broken their computer, and then as you walked through the problem with them, you'd realize that they'd had a power outage in their neighborhood, um, and that's what made their computer turn off, or that they didn't even have a computer. Like one lady called up and said she had a Sony computer, um, but this was in the time before Sony made computers, they only made monitors at that time, so it, it turned out that she didn't actually have a computer, she just had a monitor. Um, we had another lady call and couldn't get a game to install because she kept putting all of the uh, discs into the drive without ejecting the ones that had gone in there before. Uh, so it was pretty um, entertaining. I'm still not super clear on what's going on here. Uh, that's probably because I'm not really paying attention to the story. I do remember at one point John Carmack saying to us all, with regards to story, that Doom and Quake needed story like a porn, mo a porn movie needed story. So he was not at all big on narrative design or story design. He felt that um, the games were primarily a technology, I guess, and art showcase, but cer certainly about technology, like how many bits could you get on the screen at once, and how fast, Gee, and that's a big monster. Um, so when we would talk about story uh, and game design, he was not interested at all. Which, it's funny to see now, there's obviously some story going on in here. Is that a cacodemon? Looks like a cacodemon. But that actually caused a lot of problems um, working at id, because there were people like myself who really wanted to put story into the games. I remember when Paul Steed showed up to work on Quake or Quake 2, 
he was really big on wanting to put story into the games and we started to see other companies like Valve using our engines to do things with story in 3D action games that was uh, pretty impressive. Like the first time we ever saw Valve had used um, the Quake engine for an early version of Half-Life and when we saw that um, it, you know it was really impressive but it was also against the company culture to be impressed by it. Um, I remember I got in trouble like I got negative feedback for being impressed by what Valve was doing with Half-Life. So um, yeah, crazy. Um, it looks like I've already done sticky bombs. So I'm going to do, I add more sticky bombs? No, I'm going to add full auto. There we go. But yeah, it in those days was uh, very high pressure, very um, long work hours, very kind of brutal culture. Um, okay, so I've got to press F to swap weapon mods, right. I'm gonna have to try to remember that. I'm sure I'm gonna forget. Um, but yeah, when we were working on Doom and Quake, we were having to spend, all right, an objective marker shows you where your current objective is. It's present in the compass auto map. Uh, righty, show, press Alt. Alt, what is that? I don't know what that even means. What the hell is in a uh, lalt? That alt? Oh, left alt. Okay. Woo! Killing stuff. Um, yeah, so Doom, or id culture. Id culture was really, really tough. We were working crazy hours. Like, 12 hours a day was not enough. You were expected to work um, 16 hours a day, 18 hours a day, which left very little time or things like eating and sleeping um, and it was such that like if you if you worked a few hours less than the other guys you were getting a lot of stress from them um, so there was a lot of sleeping in the office sleeping on the floor sleeping on the sofas and um, I remember I did that for the first two years pretty much non-stop because you would because like if you were given that kind of opportunity you would go to work and you'd never go home um, because you wouldn't want to lose the opportunity. But um, I remember it got to a point where it, it really got to me. Like, we'd shipped one or two um, games, and I felt like I needed a break, and I knew there were other people that needed a break, um, but we really weren't allowed much um, in the way of breaks. And um, I think that uh, that that aspect of the company um, probably, over time, um, really started to damage the quality of the output. Uh-oh. I feel like that's not a good thing to fall down. Um, it certainly was not healthy um, for the people working there. And then there was a lot of politics involved um, at it as well. As we hired new people into the company, I was like the seventh or eighth employee, but we started hiring like a new guard of people. And um, they started introducing um, very toxic politics uh, and taking advantage of sort of like uh, relationships and weaknesses amongst people's personalities and you know um, it just got to be where it was very unpleasant to go into work and that that ended up in with a lot of people getting fired in the time that I was there um, yeah it was it was tough um, and I ultimately got fired from id as well and it was quite a shock to be fired because if you go look at the the data of the information on the number of maps that I produced while I was an IND employee. Um, it was a pretty significant number for a single individual to produce. And um, I thought, um, you know, the quality of that stuff and the amount of it um, was the kind of thing that you wouldn't go and fire someone for. All right, what is this? This is a certain demon, weak points, extra shots. So basically shoot him in his brain pole and uh, that's good, okay. Well, let's see if I can shoot him in his brain pole. Although it looks like I'm about to run out of ammo. But yeah, I was pretty shocked when I got fired. Um, I remember we'd finished Quake 2 and I had done a lot of, um, uh oh, I seem to have completely run out of ammo here. I'd done a lot of map work on that and a lot of programming and the sound effects stuff as well. And, um, I think I'm going to die. It's time to die. Um, and I was uh, 
tasked with something weird, like go and make um, doors, I think it was. I can't remember what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to make like models of, of doors um, using the new engine. And it felt kind of like busy work. Um, anyway, I worked on some like doors, <laughs> like the arches that go around doors for a week or two. And then I went to turn those into the art staff and I could tell that Something was really wrong, um, and a few days after that, they called me in and they said, "We're letting you go." Um, and it was it was very weird. It was it was very surreal. I'd been there for four years, um, and I didn't see that coming. Um, now I'll say, like at that time, I was very burnt out, and you know I probably wasn't being like the best employee in the world, um, but I didn't expect to get fired. Um, though by that point. I was actually like one of the last of the old old guard to get fired because by that point they fired Romero and I think Dave Taylor had left, they fired Sandy Peterson, Sean had left, um, basically like everybody was gone except the owners. Um, everybody of the original kind of id, id doom, the Doom crew, the, the Quake crew, everybody was gone. Uh, Paul Steed had been fired or let go or he quit, I can't remember. but. Um, yeah, so off I went. Went to EA and made the Alice games. Or the first Alice game. Uh, what do we got going on in the chat? I need a cardboard cut out of Martin in the empty chair. Yes, that would be a good idea. Um, I'm supposed to use my imagination that Martin is here. And, um, yeah, all right. All good. Uh, what else can I tell you about id? about my time at id. I don't know what to talk about while um, playing this. I guess I could talk a bit about, like I went from being a car mechanic, okay, Q to swap to my weapon, okay. Um, yeah, so I went from being a car mechanic, being a level designer, and I know a lot of people always ask, like, how, did, how exactly did you do that? Um, it turns out that I did have a lot of computer skills prior to dropping out of high school, prior to going to um, be a car mechanic. And I also had uh, writing and kind of artistic skills. I was, you know, I liked both of those things. Um, and so when it came time, what the hell is that? What's oh, a map? When it came time to kind of like go to work at id, um, I really quickly picked up. Okay, we've got to press tab to open the dossier. Apparently, I'm here to interrupt the Degic Council. And get aboard the citadel sounds interesting right so here's a map yeah so my first thing it, it did as i said was tech support but while i was answering those tech support phone calls um i first of all i knew that my time at id as a tech support person was very limited because id's games were becoming incredibly popular and it, it was obvious that it was impossible for two guys myself and sean to handle all of the id tech support phone calls. Um, so I knew that at some point in the relatively not distant future that that job would be outsourced to, to somewhere else. Um, and so I started playing around inside the map editor and I took to it really quickly. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, maybe just good mo motivation, but um, yeah, I took to it pretty fast um, and I was, I was good at it pretty quickly. Um, it was, in those days, it was what we called 2.5D level editing, because Doom, the original Doom was not a proper 3D game, it was a 2D game with kind of a height map, like uh, elevation differences between floors. What did they say about switching weapons? Oh, I'll just use the mouse wheel. Um, so, building maps in the original Doom editor was basically like you drew lines to designate walls, and then you did um, height adjustments on the borders of the, the lines, and then you had to go in there and do like your texture applications. And everything that we did in terms of, of maps, you had to do a BSP build. Um, so there was this technology that John Carmack had adopted called binary space partitions, which was a way of compressing the data of the 3D world into essentially like lookup table like leafs that could be accessed really fast so that you could hide all of the non-visible 
data, the stuff that you didn't want to render on screen, you could hide that and then look it up really fast, um, which was important because PCs back in those days had really limited memory and they were obviously quite slow. Um, so to invent a technology that allowed for the storage of the 3D map data, or just the map data in general, inside of a structure that was um, fast in terms of how you traversed it to unlock what should be displayed on screen versus what shouldn't, um, to, to build that technology uh, was, was very revolutionary. And so um, that was what John did in terms of tech. Um, but yeah, the resulting editor for, for us level designers was like a, a architecture program that was basically just 2D lines on a map. And then um, you went in and adjusted heights and, and added textures, like I said. So um, I got to be um, very good at that. I was very fast at that. And um, I just started building maps, and before you knew it, um, my maps were being... I was told that I was going to be a level editor, and my maps would be in the, the, the games proper. So I, I transitioned from answering the phones to, uh, to building maps, and uh, that put me to work immediately on Doom 2. So I didn't actually contribute maps to the original Doom, but I did do maps for the subsequent, like, Doom... Um, there were, like, these... Uh, what are they called? Somebody's gonna have to remind me what the hell I worked on. Um, they were like map packs. Uh, I can't remember what they were called, but I did a bunch of these maps for the level the level packs that followed Doom. And then um, I worked on Doom 2 as well. Um, yeah. These guys... I think I'm getting motion sickness. It's great. <laughs> People used to get a lot of motion sickness playing these games back in the day, because the frame rate uh, will mess you up. And back then the frame rates were pretty low and the refresh rates were really low. Um, so Doom was responsible for making people get motion sickness and then it ended up in the Physician's Desktop, Physician's Desktop Reference, um, this concept of uh, computer game induced motion sickness and it was referred to as... Ah, oh, did I die? Yeah, alright. Um, it was referred to as DIMS. Doom induced motion sickness. So... Um, I think that might have been the first time that a video game ended up inventing a sickness. There you go. Um, right. Good and fast, useful combo. Dramamine. Yes, I could use some Dramamine. Did you ever do anything with Duke Nukem? Says, I'm just flack. No, I didn't have anything to do with Duke Nukem. That was the 3D Realms guys, um, who were also in Dallas. Um, but it was weird. Back in those days, 3D Realms and Epic and Id were very adversarial and so we were not allowed to or not encouraged to fraternize with other people in our industry um, even though like the 3D Realms guys were just down the street from us uh, there was a um, there was a kind of unspoken rule that we not uh, we not be friendly and I think part of that had to do with the concern around sort of industrial espionage, because what we were working on in those days was technically um, very cutting edge. And I think there was a, a sense that, you know, these other teams, uh, Tim Sweeney and uh, the team led by George Broussard, um, they could learn you know, sort of how John Carmack was cracking the code for fast display of 3D graphics and they could get to market with something um, before us. And so there was a, it was definitely a sense that we shouldn't be friends with those guys. They were the enemy. <laughs> there was no question about that. Um, now later on, uh, once id started, sort of started falling apart, and people were, were getting out of id um, and going off and starting their own companies like Romero started his own company then the development scene in Dallas um, opened up it became a lot more friendly um, but I think definitely at, at the beginning there it was quite icy um, id and 3d realms and a couple of these companies Ion Storm, they ultimately ended up you know sort of creating the basis for Dallas as a game development hub um, but in the early days there was um, there was no sense of that. There was no sense of sort of, uh, there's a lot of bad guys down there. 
Um, there was no sense that, that that id owed anything to the industry or that the industry um, owed anything to id. Um, these companies really did not get along, so... Um, but later on they did. Later on everybody worked together, everybody, everybody met everybody else, and um, the industry, I think, the games industry as a whole grew, um, obviously quite fast, and so it became really difficult for people not to... not to know each other and not to hang out, not to be friendly, so... Um, oh god, I died. Again. It wasn't good. Um, so Rosovoff says, I was discussing Doom with my brother the other day. It may not have been uh, truly 3D, but it was crucial stepping stone that brought us to where we are now. It was part of what got the world ready for 3D games. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it was revolutionary. Uh, you know, obviously there was nothing... Well, there were some games like it before. I remember, like, Magic Carpet and Marathon and a couple of other 3D games that were out there, but in terms of, like, really fast... 3D, um, in terms of, I think, just the the pace of the, the battles with the enemies and things like that, um, there hadn't really been anything quite like it. And it got a really good combination of speed and violence and art, and um, it just, you know, it, it, it felt like it was the game of the day. I remember we went to New York for the these launch parties, and they were huge, you know? These were games that now we kind of laugh about it like you know back in the day when doom um you know sort of sold did a pre-sale of like a couple million dollars that was that was massive nobody had ever seen a video game make millions of dollars before um on pre-sales but um doom did you know it was like it it doom 2 pre-sold you know 10 million dollars or something crazy like that um, and that's why, you know, everybody working at id was driving around in Ferraris and Vipers and all kinds of crazy supercars. Um, because it, it was also the start of commercial, um, widespread, you know, video game culture. Like, people wanting to be a part of playing something like Doom. Um, I guess I was supposed to chainsaw that guy. Probably I shouldn't play around too close to that barrel, though. Come on, buddy. Ouch. Here. Can I kick that barrel over to him? No. And yeah, I mean, I, I remember we were in uh, Suite 666 in Mesquite, Texas, and what we were doing was so kind of revolutionary. Um, you know, people from around the world wanted to come visit those offices, and um, of course we had people around the world playing the games. We had one professor at a big university, I can't remember which university it was, but he wrote into us after we had done um, the open beta for Quake, I think it was, and um, he, how do I get in there? Um, he asked that we stop releasing betas of our games around testing time, and he sent along these graphs, and he showed how, um, as a result of id releasing their games in the, at the times that they did, um, college entrance and college um, exit university, like the university exit um, exams, uh, the scores were significantly less than they should have been uh, historically. And basically what the guy was showing was that all these students were staying up super late playing these betas of, the, of our games instead of studying for their uh, instead of studying for their tests. So he asked us to please consider the children and stop releasing our game demos or the, the open betas um, around test time for the universities because we were making American kids dumb. So <laughs> that was a fun fact. We may have harmed America's GDP for a few years there by releasing game demos at the wrong time. All right, I remember it told me to pull up the map. There's the map. There's something there. Uh, right. I seem to have cleared this area out. Have we got any comments in, uh, uh no, no. I'm gonna have to run away in a minute here, though, because I'm definitely getting motion sick, because I'm playing this thing in a window on the desktop, and it's making me feel ill. That's not good. All right. I think that's it for me today. I did my network test, and it looks like our network is back up again. And I don't want to play until I vomit, so 
uh, long was that? It wasn't very long. I appreciate you guys dropping in for a minute. I will try to play Doom again soon, uh, but I'm going to have to adjust my setup here so that it doesn't make me want to throw up all over the place, because I definitely am getting motion sick, so. Alrighty, um, yeah, where's the, where's the stop button? How do I get off this thing? All right, everybody, uh, have a good night or day wherever you are in the world. Social distancing. <laughs> Talk to you later. See you later.